Okay, so I think it's time to, to move on now. Uh, is everyone uh, hearing me? Yes, perfect. Good. So uh, welcome to session one uh, about urban mobility futures. So we will start uh, by having a keynote presentation uh, by Ola, and then uh, we will continue with the uh, question and answers and break, and then move to a, a nice uh, round table at the end of the morning. So uh, to, just to introduce Ola, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so it's our great pleasure to, to have uh, Professor Ole Jensen, Professor of Urban Theory from Aalborg University. Um, so uh, it, it's really nice to have you. Uh, Ole is a co-founder of the Center for Mobilities and Urban Studies. And he wrote uh, several inspiring books, so among which uh, Staging Mobilities. And he will give a talk on futuring mobilities in times of uncertainty. So without any delay, uh, I will give you the floor, Ola, and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you. If I can share my screen. Does that work for you? Yes, perfect. Okay, thanks. So thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this colloquium. Um, I'm going to be speaking to the title Futuring Mobilities in Times of Uncertainty. Um, this is roughly the, um, the plan of my presentation. So after my introduction, I'll say a few things about cities as infrastructural landscapes, um, and then move on quite quickly to uh, thoughts about the future, thinking about social futures and how we in our research at Albert University in Seamus, the Center for Mobility and Urban Studies, have been inspired um, and, and working with futures. Um, and then I want to touch shortly upon uh, this uh, theme that uh, nobody can sort of ignore, uh, which is the COVID-19 or what we call the pandemic society, and hopefully at the end uh, wrap up. Um, just for starters, this was the kind of abstract. Um, I think what is key here is that uh, mobility in many ways can be said to be one of the key determinant factors in the development of urban morphologies. And the ways in which cities have grown and developed is a function of some mobility systems and infrastructural landscapes, connecting as well as disconnecting urban nodes and agglomerations in complex geographies of proximity and connectivity. So with the advent of automated technologies and network digital technologies, the future of urban mobility seems borderless. And yet, in the sobering midst of the COVID-19, the world has come to, if not a halt, then at least a pause. And questions about future trajectories and development patterns have fueled heated public debates. In this presentation, I will shortly discuss the role of urban mobilities as a vital force of the network city. And then follows a discussion about futures and urban imaginaries or utopian imaginaries as a framework for thinking about futures. The COVID-19 as a global disruptive event will then be discussed and finally some more speculative reflections upon where to this might lead and will be offered. But first of all, um, that's the point of departure, which also I think resonates quite well with the uh, mindset that we've just been hearing about for the chair and for the whole uh, context of this colloquium, thinking about cities as infrastructural landscapes. Um, in particular, I'm interested in stressing that the role of mobility is, is much more than studying vehicles and informations and goods uh, moving from point A to point B, um, which is hence why we for the last 20 years uh, have worked with the mobilities uh, turn rather than the transportation perspective. So thinking carefully about what is the more than it be in terms of social effects, cultural effects, environmental effects, and other kinds of effects seems to be quite important and also resonating with some of the challenges that Jakob presented us with just uh, earlier. Um, and as most of us know, and these are come up, some of the clips from our you know, school geography books and, 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 and the sort of standard perceptions, uh, cities have developed from mononuclears uh, bounded entities into networked uh, nodes uh, in, in, in places as 
um, assemblages of various um, elements of infrastructure, technology, and, and flows. Um, these are complex mappings and, 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 and diagrams. So what I really prefer often is the shorthand by Secret Price saying that the cities have kind of developed from the ancient perspective where you could sort of resemble the city to a boiled egg. And then over a period where it could be more like a fried egg. And now uh, the contemporary city is much more like a scrambled egg. And of course, this is um, a bit of a, a bit of a, um, a sort of an over exaggeration, but it also speaks to the fact that the morphology of cities, the, the form, the shape, the ways in which cities manifest themselves physically um, has changed. And we obviously know that, but that also means that the conceptualizations, the theories and research coming along and trying to figure out what goes on needs to change. One of the most predominant and uh, important features of that is to rethink our notion of place, to understand that places are need to be thought about relationally. We need to think about the relationality of place and the ways in which places are coupled or decoupled to systems of infrastructure with various kinds of mobilities and flows of various kinds of entities from matter and energy, water, sewages, electricity, um, communication, and, and, and of course, people, vehicles, uh, goods, and so forth. <clears throat> and in particular, I think that um, the advent of what you might want to call digital network connectivity seems to have changed um, quite a few things around cities. Um, and in this colloquium, obviously also are, this is part of the background uh, thinking for uh, mobility as a service, for the various ways in which you can think about automated mobilities and these kinds of things. But on a slightly more profound or maybe um, foundational level, we might want to think about this as something that has changed and influenced what I call the proximity connectivity nexus. The proximity connectivity nexus is maybe not the most beautiful term, but it illustrates the fact that there is a relation between being close and being connected. That has been the case for as long as we've been walking this earth, but the ways in which that dynamics has been playing out has changed immensely, not just with the urban uh, agglomerations, but also in particular with the admin of digital network uh, communication. And I suppose that this colloquium on its own is a testament to this, right? So we are together in a kind of sense, uh, we are connected, but we are not pro proximate, right? So the ways in which we have to think about the relationality of place in the advent of digital communication technology is through um, a reworking of how closeness and connect and connections uh, needs to be thought of. Um, in the old model of barter economy, you would, you would have to go to the other to either communicate or exchange, you know, on the market, exchange goods. Um, nowadays, we can exchange uh, without being present, of course, anywhere, um, or anywhere near those we are interacting with, of course. So the proximity connectivity nexus is, is, is kind of being massaged and, ch and changed and, and transformed uh, as a function of this. And that on the ground, which is where I do my research, uh, leads also to a different dynamics for the ways in which we meet uh, other uh, humans on the ground in infrastructure systems as we move through cities. Um, and we might want to think about what I've called elastic situations. This idea that we are actually connecting um, at distance across time and, 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 and in space, uh, carrying networks as it were. And this is, this is sort of changing the way in which we think about uh, things. And of course that has led to an immense um, uh, number of, of speculations about futures um, lots of thoughts about how this could revolutionize. I heard the word revolution here as well this morning. Um, so um, why not touch base on how to think about social futures then? In, in our work at the Center for Mobilities and Urban Studies, CMUS and Alborg, we've been very much inspired by uh, these two um, perspectives. One is the, um, the thoughts and writings of John Uri, um, in this case, uh, um, exemplified with, the, with his book from 2016, uh, What is the Future? And the other one is by another sociologist, Ruth Levitas, speaking about utopia as a method, uh, the imaginary reconstitution of society. And starting out with the latter, Levitas argues, quote, that the utopian experiment disrupts the taking for granted nature of the present. It creates spaces in which we temporarily experience an, alter an alternative configurations of needs 
wants and satisfaction. And of course, you might want to think about whether, uh, and I want to come back to that uh, later, uh, whether you want to uh, entertain the idea that you could think about COVID-19 and the whole sort of um, reaction to that as uh, part of a experimental uh, condition, at least. Um, maybe not so much something that we wanted, but something that since it goes on actually uh, lends itself to an interpretation along some of those lines. Now, the other element that I want to uh, stress uh, as an important uh, inspiration for a way of thinking about futures is the work by John Uri. And uh, as John Uri rightly says in, in this opening of, of, of his book, he says, quote, in most known societies, the future has been extensively imagined and foretold. Often these processes of future making were entrusted to specialists of the future. These varying across different historical and geographical contexts. Such specialists include prophets, diviners, seers, oracles, witches, technologists, sages, astrologers, clairvoyants, novelists, wizards, futurologists, fortune tellers, and so on. And so the engagement with futures, at least in my area where I'm, uh, I'm a sociologist, have um, for some time maybe not been so central. And it's been sort of um, uh, taking over or being dealt with in other professions, um, futurologists, economists, and so forth. Um, so one of the things that we've been inspired by John Uri's work is to, to realize that futures are contested. Um, there are, obviously, um, they are kind of opening up conversations and controversies, as it were. Um, but also that you can think of them as plural, um, that it seems like there are many ways in which you can uh, imagine uh, futures, and there are many ways in which you can foresee and project futures, um, as it were. But most importantly, um, Uri's perspective lear learns us that futures comes in uh, in the vari variation of the plurality. They come in, in at least three different shapes, as it were, as possible futures, something that we might think of as being a possibility, but also as probable futures. And finally, as preferable futures. And I think this simple little distinction is quite essential because very often uh, the preferable uh, is confused with you know, the probable. Um, and this is why it's important for us to rethink uh, future work and try to engage seriously with, with these kinds of things. And finally, a thing that comes out of January's uh, engagement with uh, future thinking is um, maybe the most important one, I think, in light of the challenges we've just been seeing this morning. And that is that futures and the conversation about futures needs to be democratized. So generally speaks about democratizing futures as a way in which um, research needs to engage with the, uh, the many possibilities of futuring and bringing those ideas to a wider public uh, uh, discussion. Um, how do we fuel the public debate with different uh, perspectives of potential futuring? Uh, and I think that's a, it's a tall order, it's a, it's a high claim, but it's also important in the light of the conversation about um, the, the necessity of, of, uh, of research for societies. It's a tightrope, it balances quite a few um, problematic things, maybe in terms of, of how you engage with publics uh, with your results, uh, but nevertheless, it seems very, very important. Now, from that perspective, um, a more hands-on kind of discussion maybe of how we work with it is, and this is a diagram um, coming out of a conversation I've had with Monica Bischer from uh, our sister um, uh, institute, uh, the Center for Mobilities Research in Lancaster in the UK. Um, and so when we work with futures in our curriculum, in our research, we kind of juggle these two kinds of questions. The, um, the utopian inspired creative designerly perspective of opening up saying, what if, what if this was happening? What if, what if this was possible? What if things were different? Imagining and opening up a, a kind of utopian inspired rethinking of multiple possible futures. But at the same time, closing down, asking the question, what now? Closing down to concrete actions, hard choices and ethical responsibilities. Only staying up in the what if, realm seems to be um, a, poor, uh, um, a poor strategy if you want to direct your research towards societies, towards actual needs to, or towards um, concrete uh, uh, wicked problems um, that we're facing or the, the global cha challenges. 
so for instance we could entertain our um our taking for grantedness of cities uh, to to us this is a diagram i often share with my students what if intersection crossings were designed for pedestrians and not vehicles and obviously um the clever and true transportation uh, geographers among, amongst us would say yeah then it's the city will grind to a halt exactly so but the exercise of what if in this case is to open up a space of imagination rethinking the trajectories of technologies that uh, has locked in our ways of thinking about uh, mobility about the cities about futures um, we have different uh, other elements uh, where we can work with this um, as uh, a sociologist within a, a design uh, and architecture environment i've been looking a lot towards the architects um, this is another way of asking that question. It's actually way ahead of the 15 minute city. So this is a design studio made by Vinnie Mars many years ago. What if everything was within five minutes reach? How would the city look? How do you have to manipulate it? Or uh, another architectural studio saying, what if cars could fly? Um, and admittedly, those two questions at the time of conceiving them were conceived or thought of as rather far-fetched and, um, and, and, uh, and utopian in the kind of negative sense. I think history of technology and development uh, has proven that they are maybe closer to, uh, to the possible than we actually realized at that time. Now, let me then, um, from this general discussion of the cities and mobility and social futures, let me try just very quickly to touch base on a project that we've been working with in uh, the Center for Mobility Service Studies um, for the last four years. Uh, the Airport City Futures Project is a project work where we work together in collaboration with the, the, um, the Airport of Copenhagen and, and a number of operators. And we're doing a very sort of profound and, and, and thorough uh, investigation of the airport um, in terms of catchment areas, in terms of operators, in terms of airport design, uh, passenger experiences, um, a number of different things. But also, and this is why I want to bring it here today, we work with scenarios. Um, and here we took our point of departure and inspiration again from John Uri's work. And in a 2009 uh, uh, publication, he almost prophetically said, quote, two visions then for the future, Virgin Galactica and flying cars for all, or rusting planes and generic runaways as drought flu and floods ravage the land. What happens to air travel will index what happens to the high carbon societies of which flying machines for the masses were perhaps one hybrid too far. So in coining out for uh, future scenarios, um, we worked with the assistant of uh, Mimi Scheller, uh, another uh, very influential uh, mobility scholars from the US. And this is a, a small piece from a, a forthcoming paper uh, that Mimi Scheller and I are authoring on this. Um, and the key here is that, that we're working with maximum variation thinking. So looking at the airport, we try to establish four scenarios um, to re-articulate the probable, the possible, and the preferable futures of air airport cities. And the inspiration to ask the underrated, in social science at least, what if question, have pointed us to a future, future, fruitful way of engaging with the uncertainties, the ambiguities, and wicked problems of a sector that only a few years ago showed only very small signs of wanting to change. We see the future scenario method and the discussion as one viable road into a much wider discussion about sustainability and how to address climate change, unquote. And so we developed four scenarios and I, because of time, I am prevented from going into them indeed, but of course I'll be interested in, 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 in sharing ideas with you and when the publication is out, I'll be happy to circulate them as well. So the airport is kind of like the business as usual. Uh, the smart port is the, future uh, of, of uh, or the, the airport uh, uh, totally technologized. The EcoPort is the rethinking in alliance uh, ecofuels and uh, sustainable uh, air mobilities paradigm. And then finally, the Fortress Airport is kind of dystopian, uh, you know, breakdown scenarios um, where we are facing a lot of, 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 of dire uh, consequences for, for the air mobilities uh, with fortifications of airports, with strive stratification even further in terms of inequalities of air mobilities. So what we discussed is that basically no airport is an island and, uh, and that we need to think about airports as learning airports in ways of which they are engaging with the surrounding context. And I suppose here you can actually substitute the airport with a number of other 
critical transportation functions uh, of this environment you know, of, of society. Um, and the four scenarios um, also, because of the maximum variation, has uh, deliberately been spanned out so that you create a thinking space um, that we can engage with in terms of, of having this conversation about futuring your mobilities in, in this case. And of course, the idea here would then be to bring this conversation and these results into a public discussion in, a, in an attempt to democratize futures of air mobilities. So I think we could argue that imagining mobile futures needs to be socially inclusive, environmentally friendly, resilient and risk adverse and flexible and thus vulnerable. And I think we can find all these key terms in a number of, of, uh, of sort of almost like manuals for how to think about uh, infrastructures and cities and mobilities in, in, in the future of orientation. But also, and I think this is where um, one of my interests comes in at least, also to think about uh, these uh, futures as inspiring and attractive, as open-minded and fun, as something that we are striving to get, not because uh, we necessarily need to, but because we, uh, we actually want to. Um, and that's, of course, the balance. A lot of our futuring has to do with needs that we are pressured into, like, for instance, COVID-19. But also, of course, we can think about uh, some that we are attracted to simply because of the ways in which they enliven our cities, how they stimulate our spaces and so forth. So just the, the final point on, on the futuring, I think um, we want to lean us lean up against uh, the philosopher Donna Haraway when she argues that, uh, quote, in urgent times, many of us attempted to address trouble in terms of making an imagined future safe, of stopping something from happening that looms in the future, of clearing away the present and the past in order to make futures for coming generations. Staying with the trouble does not require such relationships to the times called futures. In fact, Staying with the trouble requires learning to be truly present. And this is why I want to turn into um, the, uh, the second uh, sort of example of futuring and, and how to think about futures, which is stimulated, as it were, by the um, event of, of COVID-19. And this is a book, unfortunately, uh, in this context, it's in Danish, um, the, the Epidemisk Gesamtfund, which roughly translates to the Pandemic Society. Uh, it's a book published in December 2020, uh, and it's edited by Nikolai Schultz and myself. And we brought in 20-some uh, sociologists and uh, asked them to reflect upon um, a number of different uh, dimensions of COVID-19 and, and societies, anything from migration to transportation, uh, power issues, um, sustainability, uh, a number of different um, elements. And of course, the backcloth of this is the understanding of COVID-19 as a global crisis, as something um, that has uh, changed the way in which we engage um, with any, pretty much everything in our everyday life courses. And as sociologists, this has struck us as, you know, something that we needed to engage with, um, to study societies out of balance. Um, since its birth in the 19th century, one of the core issues or task for sociologists have been a theoretical and empirical informed analysis of social change. And you know some of the concepts, acceleration society by Rosa or risk society by Ulrich Beck, um, questions about how modernity with technology um, and, and, and control um, at the same time becomes subject to risk, vulnerability and potential collapse. Ulrich Beck argues actually in his book, Risk Society, that the risk society is a catastrophic society. Um, Time again prevents me from going deep into all of this and from the book. But one of the key things, of course, is that virus um, have, have always been, but in particular nowadays, uh, intimately connected to mobilities. Virus travels with the speed of the existing transportation technology. So in COVID-19, it travels with about 800 kilometers an hour, which is a bit of uh, the reason why we have this challenge that we have. But also that virus has agency and it's neither natural or external to societies. Um, it becomes intertwined. Uh, some dimensions of it might be the ways in which it's been, uh, 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 it, it's, it's actually sort of um, come, come off the ground, as it were. Where does it come from? How does it, how does it manifest itself? But as soon as it starts moving around, um, it, it ceases to be uh, anything, uh, you know, external to, to, uh, to our societies. Um, but also one of the things that we have seen and this is, of course, the political discussion that comes out of COVID-19 is that societies and processes of societal development can be changed. Um, whether you want it or, and how you want it is a different kind of question. 
Um, if we turn to mobilities, of course, we've seen a lot of um, transformation. This is from The Economist, uh, but I, I'm pretty sure you can make this in, in almost any kind of, of area. Um, the worldwide revenue passenger kilometers flown um, with the dramatic drop and then the forecast with a huge span of uncertainty. Uh, where will this go? Um, in my own research, I've been looking at the mined mobilities. Um, this is a photo I took last summer from my hometown. This is a pedestrian area in Oborg, and you can see the yellow stripe trying to organize and orchestrate the flow of pedestrians on the city streets, um, taking into account what in some uh, spaces have been called, uh, Peter Paul Fabek from Holland has called it the 1.5 meter society. So this notion of social distance as, um, as something that starts uh, fueling um, not only the immediate regulatory frameworks for dealing with COVID-19, but also starting to sort of uh, fuel the imaginary of, of, of uh, some of the most profound elements of urbanism, you know, the fact that we are a close, dense, and in interaction. How do we think about that in the light of, of uh, requirements for keeping further distance? Um, in the literature or, uh, or various places, you have had different ways of envisioning how you can orchestrate and, and, uh, and manipulate and, and, and stage um, these kinds of things, like in this uh, photo where you see um, the little territories being marked up. And of course, um, this is probably something that we would like not to see as, as, uh, as a general rule. But if you upscale that way of thinking, we are kind of back to the conversation about um, not the five minute city, but this time the 15 minute city. Um, in particular, of course, in Paris, um, but also in other big cities around the world, um, the COVID-19 uh, experiment, as it were, has been, or event has been utilized for experimenting with um, various ways in which you can rethink um, the, the, the city and rethink mobility patterns. Of course, it's not done overnight, um, just because you're closing off a street doesn't make everyone uh, accessible within 15 minutes and so forth. So it's a totally different kind of mindset that we're looking into. Right, time is progressing. So I wanna, wanna sort of start my in-flight towards the, uh, the, the landing here. Um, so what's next? And I think we can, we can talk about a number of things here. Um, but one thing that I think is important is that the COVID-19 has provoked our understanding of fixed spatial scales. And yes, indeed, it is a global phenomenon, but at the same time, it touches upon the geography closes in, as it's called. Um, as COVID-19 is in the body and transported by the body, it makes no sense to separate the local from the global. The COVID-19 pandemic partly shakes social institutions and illustrates vulnerabilities of infrastructures as well as governmental capacities or lack hereof to deal with these disruptive events. In many ways, it can also be seen as a comment to the ongoing debate about our ability to sustain life uh, in a sustainable form on this planet. The problems we are facing moves beyond territories and species and renders the world awfully connected and disconnected at the same time. The former because of the interdependent relations that we're facing and the latter due to the fallouts of areas and disconnects of territories. COVID-19 reminds us about serious matters of concern that require planetary consciousness and action. Now I'm coming back to one of the questions that I flagged earlier on. So where will this go? Um, in, the, in the public debate in Denmark at least, um, the COVID-19 in, in 2020 wasn't, the, the event wasn't very old before you've had people starting to say, oh, it will, it will come back to normal. Everything will come back to, you know, and, and you have other people saying it will, nothing will ever be the same. I'm personally thinking of a more uh, pragmatic and, and nuanced interpretation, um, which is why I, I kind of uh, chose the pendulum as, as the symbol here, um, that something will definitely come back to normal, but something will definitely also change. And the question, of course, is the political space of transformation. What are the kinds of things that we can utilize COVID-19 to rethink and actually have a quick conversation about whether we wish for this to swing back to normal, or whether we actually wish for this to to uh, to re um, to be a re rethinking um, or reenactment uh, kind of event. And of course, this is a political question. Um, I think what it has shown, and that is uh, was also one of my points earlier on, is that um, some of the structures and the obturate structures that I study as a sociologist are seem very fixed, but they're actually changeable, right? we can actually change the way in which we organize things. Um, the question is the willingness to do so. And as researchers, I think our obligation is to 
throw light on the various options, um, the future in, um, and the various ways in which we can think about possible futures. So let me end with a quote from uh, the Italian uh, mathematician and physicist uh, Giordano um, in his fantastic little book, Contagion, um, where he says, uh, quote, the personal and the global is intertwined in ways that are so mysterious that we become exhausted even before we as much as try to think it through. Contagion is an encouragement to think. Um, the time of the quarantine is the opportunity to do so. Think about what? That we're not just a part of human community. We are the most intrusive species in a fragile and unique ecosystem. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Ola, for this uh, rich and very nice talk. So, uh, we're heading to the questions. If I'm checking on the discussion, if there are some, uh, maybe not. I'm checking also on YouTube. Uh, maybe to start with, I'll have one for you. Um, I noted one, uh, which we are especially interested in regarding the, the notion of imaginaries you mentioned in the first part. So um, what I was wondering is how do you manage to actually practice research dealing with this notion of imaginaries uh, with the stakeholders? How do you practically do that? Because we know that we want to do that. We, we want to do participatory things, but what is your experience with that? Uh, things that go well, things that are difficult. Yeah, thanks. Well, that's a great question. Actually, we've been inspired by your work uh, in, <laughs> in your group with the scenarios and the stakeholder involvement. Um, I think our, there, are, there are different ways in which we can think about um, uh, how to work with, with imaginaries. Um, and, and, and a lot of it is already well described in the literature, right? You can have, you know, Delphi methods, you can, you can talk to experts, you know, uh, people who seem to, to, to know more about you, or you can talk about with lay people, or you can try to talk both. Um, what we do in our work, um, because we work uh, close to an, an urban design and architecture environment, we tend also to do uh, workshops where we bring in a lot of material artifacts, like models, like you know, let people sort of in a physical, tangible way manipulate and move things around. Um, for various reasons, one reason is um, that uh, touching and moving artifacts and things is a, a shortcut into a way of getting people to, to communicate, right? And um, those of you who have either participated in design workshops or, or organized them would, would know that. Um, and in particular, if you bring together around the table people with different disciplinary backgrounds, uh, with different kind of vocabularies, um, the way in which to kind of make ends meet and make them connect can often go via a physical model or, or you know, a, a something that you uh, draw or manipulate, or you might even do a Lego brick kind of work mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, so I think, I think those are some of the ways in which uh, you can think about it. Um, actually, the airport, uh, the airport futures, uh, city futures project, we're trying now to get um, a uh, prolongation of some of it uh, to a postdoc where we want to talk about the technical imaginaries, uh, the, te the technological future imaginaries. We want to talk about um, uh, more closely uh, detail, we want to talk about you know, people in the sector developing eco-fuels and these kinds of things. What are their imaginaries? Um, and as, as, uh, as it is with the imaginary, it's kind of a complex um, uh, sort of dimension and we would find um, elements of, uh, of people's capacities to imagine futures that relies on personal experience, um, educational upbringing, you know, uh, disciplinary cases, but also a lot of the cultural. Um, in my own experience working with drones, for instance, I've seen that um, a lot of the imaginary around drones is coming straight, straight out of Hollywood, right? So, but also <laughs> when you talk about automation, robotics, um, <laughs> Um, I have colleagues who I work with uh, on facial recognition software, uh, visual analysis uh, software, and you know the, the kind of the kind of imaginaries that people have around what technologies can do are very often 
totally far from what they actually can do because of the of that dimension too. So it's a kind of complex relationality, but um, coming back to this idea of, of letting people touch and meet and, 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 and move stuff is, is one, one way we appreciate at least. Yeah. And do you still can manage that with the pandemics? Do, do you? No, no, that's, you don't, that's, yeah. that's true. That's, that's gone. That's gone on pause. That's gone. Yeah. 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 We, that, that's, I mean, we've done, we've done some, some interviews and as I suppose a lot of you have through this medium. Right. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's doable and you can have people um, doing collaboratory things on whiteboard, you know, with digital whiteboards as well, um, with, 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 but it's, it's not the same, right? Um, yeah, we hope to be able to move back to the, to the hands-on stuff. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Uh, is there anybody wishing? Yeah. I can see a hand rising. So if you want to, to, uh, Ask a question, yeah, and in yes. introduce yourself, please. Yes, I'm Tommaso Pardi. I'm the director of a social network on um, the automotive industry. And in the automotive industry, we are taking more and more interest in the new mobilities paradigm, and we start to look into that. And uh, one of the things that we've been discussing is the concept of disruption and how this applies to industry and mobility where products last 30 years. So one of the problem is that most of the people think about disruption like, well, the autonomous vehicle will take over the normal vehicle like the smartphone it takes over the previous phone, but it will not happen in this way because a car lasts 30 years. So we start to thinking about that more like a coexistence of distant future and uh, familiar past. So rather than paradigm change in which everything moves from a world to another with the notion of tipping point and all the concepts we know about disruption, we're more and more about thinking about the, the political coexistence of different words in the same places. And that is a very tricky political question. For example, in, in France, we had the yellow jacket movement and people mm. often do not know that all came from higher taxes on fuel. And that the yellow, yellow jacket people were actually targeting electric chair cars in the city as social enemy. And that highlights how different words of future and past where might coexist in difficult ways. And perhaps it's not as simple as the disruption concept let us think. So I would like to have your thinks, your thoughts about this. Thank you very much for your, for your great presentation. Thank you so much for a great question. And I might, it's so funny because when you, were, when you were phrasing your question in the beginning, I wrote coexistence before you actually got to it because that's exactly what I, how I like to think of it. Um, Normally, when I do a lecture on on, uh, on technology, I, I have this photo from Broadway um, in the 1910 or something in, in New York. And there was this photo of where you see the ratio between horse carriages and motor cars. And exactly 10, 10 years later, the ratio is, is reversed, right? Um, and so what you have had there, even though it's just a microcosmos, you had a, a period of coexistence between cars and horse carriages, right? Um, and so I think it's totally, uh, it's super important that we uh, stop thinking about a disruption or what I would call, you know, um, change, uh, transformation as, as these kind of very abrupt uh, events. And I think the, uh, the metaphor of, 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 co of coexistence is much more accurate. And the, the problem, of course, is that it's, if you're a politician or if you want to make a, a sort of a suggestion for what people should do, it's much easier to paint a kind of black white scenario where you could say, well, this is going to go away and this is going to substitute it. But in most cases, um, looking at electrification or looking at the, you know, the, the, the charging stations for the, the, the electric vehicle, that's going to take time, some time to roll out over, over the cities and the countries. So you will inevitably, and I think as you start thinking about the history of technology, it's really hard to imagine technologies that have really sort of sharply from one day to another uh, annihilated, you know, it, the predecessor. So I think the, um, the, the co-presence and the coexistence is the, is absolutely uh, the accurate uh, description. Now that's the, so the good news is that I totally agree with you. The bad news is that that's the most complicated scenario. It's much easier if, you know, the, um, the combustion engine would go away like that and the electric, electric vehicle will come in like that, right? So, but I think it's, it's, um, it, it has to be in businesses like yours or in research like, my, like mine, it has to come in as a forceful uh, matrix for thinking through how this needs to be uh, you know, understood. That we are actually having um, a coexistence of, of technologies, but we're also having a coexistence of value systems, right? Um, there's a strong lobby 
connected to uh, automobility, uh, to uh, to uh, the ways in which uh, the, the, the car um, is, is thought of, right? And and that taps deeply into normative ideas about you know um, how you want to be able to have autonomy as an individual and, and what it means for a person to be a person in, in, in this um, uh, social technical kind of collaboration. Uh, configuration um, so I think you know it's and, and your, your your own example with the yellow jacket suggests that that it's 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 as soon as you start looking at the normativities behind those scenarios it becomes it becomes complicated in the sense that you don't necessarily if you, just as you have coexistence of technologies you might also have coexistence of different opinions right the controversies that's the and uh, and that's probably where we are and will always be you know if you had, a, if you could imagine a one technology solution to disruption that would change people's perceptions overall 100%, and um, so everybody would agree, and I think that would be very close to some kind of of um, of like a dystopian scenario of of of, uh, of total control and, and and no freedom, right? Um, so so I think I think the 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 the, the um, um, the controversy comes along with the coexistence of technologies, and I think we have to realize that. Um, but I, I, I totally agree, coexistence is the right way of putting it. Thank you very much. Uh, any other rising hands for a, a last uh, question before a short break? Any questions from the audience? Uh, Okay, I can see speed of change as in impact. Does it inspire you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think you could say a lot of things about that. Uh, it's a little, little, little old minded, isn't it? Okay, you've got a few minutes. <laughs> no, I, I think what we're, what, we're, what we're joining around here in, in, in this colloquium and also in general is exactly uh, um, you know, trying to understand change, and uh, and of course, speed of change uh, uh, is something that that you know. It, it, I think when you're looking at at, at the um, that there are some interesting studies being done at the early days of computers, where you had had this this idea of the nanosecond culture, this idea that my computers can do things that my brain can't even figure out how to do, right? So when I'm talking to you guys, you know, my, my pension is being negotiated between two algorithms across the Atlantic or something, you know, making stock exchanges. So the, the, the speed of technology is, is already decoupled from the, 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 the kind of speed that we can, we can sense and understand. Right? Um, and I think there is, there is something about the, um, the ways in which, I mean, there are, there, a lot of these technologies are obdurate. They, they require big infrastructural changes so that takes a lot of time to install. So you don't just do it overnight. Um, on the other hand side, um, if you're looking into the way in which we as species are hardwired to, you know, understand the world, we're still running around with some pretty old software. Um, that really, uh, so I think there's some interesting discrepancies and problems to, to explore between the technological speed, change of speed, uh, speed of change, and then the, uh, our perception uh, sort of uh, ability to, to appreciate and deal with those changes. Very well, thank you. Uh, I think it's okay from the chat. So um, another question from YouTube. Okay, sorry, I didn't see it. Uh, um, I can also read it out quickly. So yeah. it's, or do you see it? Uh, where is it, the question? Well, um, Based on your slide on four types of airports, do you think more and more airports will lean towards becoming eco ports with today's bigger and bigger focus on sustainability and green thinking? It's a question from Greta Samuelion T. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank, thank you. you that's, a, that's a great question, and and uh, and um, if I if I think it it will, um, I think there is a. When we started this project four years ago, we were aware of the environmental agenda, but we had no imaginary uh, could, that could justify what would happening with the sector when uh, in when the COVID nineteen hit. And I think the whole sector has has re has really been rethinking itself, and, and it's sort of reinventing itself. Um, and I think it, 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 even though COVID nineteen doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the environmental question as such, I think the air mobility sector is is rethinking itself and reinventing itself in some very profound and deep ways. 
Um, so yes, I, I think there will be uh, much more focus on that. On the other hand side, um, and that was back to Tomaso's qu question, right? Um, you know, aircrafts, we will be, those, they just bought the, the aircraft will be around for 30 years, right? Before they have to go out of fleet. So I think, you know, there's, there is, there is some, there are, there are some obdurances in those models. So we don't see a clear cut between those scenarios either. We will see some kind of, of phasing, mod, mod, modifacing um, in and out. But I think the awareness in the, in the aeromobility sector and in industry um, towards the, um, the seriousness, and I think that this also comes back to the, the point about societal structures. And even though a lot of people yawn for coming back to traveling, right? A lot of people are also saying, well, maybe this is a, a time to stop and think uh, whether we need to pendulum to swing back to, uh, to that I can do uh, X numbers of, 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 you know, transatlantic trips every year, you know, and just like that. And we'll take uh, the last question from Abud Mohad. Uh, do you think that the future shared mobility, uh, ride sharing, carpooling, uh, would survive the direct impacts of COVID crisis and get back to normal? I think definitely that those 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 organizations and systems and technologies would will, will survive. Um, getting back to normal, I mean, they were hardly normal. Um, they, were, they were kind of still in their infancy, right? So I think what will happen to them is interesting, and I don't have a, a clear answer to that. Um, but it's, I, I think, I think it's it's beyond any doubt that we will maybe even come out of COVID nineteen with an even stronger uh, impetus to to talk about sharing, to talk about mobility as a service, to to do these kinds of things. Um, and so in that sense, you could think of COVID nineteen as something that has radicalized the the sense of urgency, uh, you know, in, in, in those questions. Um, I don't think coming back to what they were before, not necessarily, but definitely they, they'll, 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 they'll going to be around. Okay, thank you very much. I think we'll, we'll close the session for now, have a short break and start again for the round table in at, uh, uh, where was I? Uh, 15, uh, 11, 15. Uh, so thank you ever so much, Ola. It was a pleasure. You're welcome. Thank and, you for having me. And uh, let's keep in touch. And yes. uh, we are looking forward to reading your book, not in the original language, of, obviously, but no. anyway, <laughs> we'll keep, keep us posted anyway. Yeah. And uh, so let's have a coffee, drink of water, and uh, be back at 11.15. Thank you. <laughs>